welcome to Menopause Rescue. I'm Dr. Polly Watson. Midlife women are often caught up in a sea of symptoms. Too often, they're overwhelmed by the lack of support from mainstream healthcare. They're inundated with so-called experts who are selling solutions which may lack credibility. I'm a Menopause Society certified gynecologist with both traditional and functional medicine training. I'm here to guide you through this transition and help you decipher the facts from the fads. Armed with credible information, I hope you are empowered to rescue and restore your health, making the second half of your life your best. Hi, I'm Dr. Polly Watson, your host on Menopause Rescue. Today, we're gonna put on our Nancy Drew hat and we're going to try to do a little bit of detective work. So today's topic is why is my hormone replacement therapy all of a sudden not working? And sometimes this can be just because you're in perimenopause and your body is changing, but sometimes there are some common things that come up again and again that are probably worth taking some time to talk about that could really help folks when everything was going great, the birds were singing, life was good, and then your symptoms come back or your symptoms change really dramatically. So I wanna take some time today to kind of investigate those things. So the most common thing that I see, a couple of common things, but one of the most common things that I saw, especially during the pandemic, was the phone was blowing up. People are like, I need more hormones, I need more hormones, I need more hormones. And um, <laughs> it probably wasn't that they were all of a sudden more estrogen deficient, but they were having a lot of blood sugar irregularities because they were eating a loaf of sourdough bread a day <laughs> or some equivalent of a relatively refined carbohydrate that's gonna cause their blood sugar to go up and then their blood sugar is gonna crash and that those big fluctuations in blood sugar can often trigger hot flashes and night sweats. So if you've gotten on a sourdough bread kick or um, some people don't know this, like the Starbucks lattes have like 40 grams of sugar in them. So maybe you discovered some delicious latte that you think is great and haven't really looked at the nutritional content. It could be blood sugar fluctuations. We use a lot of continuous glucose monitors in our practice just so people can see in real time what's happening. Um, they can also correlate their hot flashes and night sweats. Well, if they're awake, they're night sweats to what's going on with your blood sugar. So that's a great resource if you're wondering, hey, is it blood sugar fluctuation affecting this? Look at your diet, see, see what's going on. Are you having carbs without protein, really refined carbs, and how many carbs are you having? So we really wanna avoid refined sugars, white flours, those kind of things. And if we're gonna have those things, we wanna eat them after we've had fiber, fat, protein, and then hopefully some movement is on board to help your body use up those carbohydrates right away. So blood sugar fluctuations are a huge reason why hot flashes and night sweats kind of come back. Alcohol is another big one that we saw a lot of in the pandemic, and I feel like there are plenty of people that are still really struggling. They got habituated to having daily alcohol that feels really normal to them at this point. I am officially no fun on so many levels, but alcohol is one more of those levels where I'm officially no fun. Alcohol is linked to several different kinds of cancer, including breast cancer and colon cancer. Um, I think of alcohol as a special occasion thing. Alcohol, I don't think, should be something that's in our daily lives. Alcohol is a toxin. The metabolites of the alcohol can wake us up and can certainly precipitate hot flashes and night sweats. So that can be another reason. Maybe something really fun's going on. Maybe you've met someone fantastic and you're having a lot of celebratory meals and there's alcohol with that, maybe that's part of what's going on. One thing that I think a lot of patients don't understand is that many of us are given a generic formulation and the generic formulation can change without any awareness on the, the part of the healthcare provider who prescribed the medication or on the part of the patient. You just come and you pick up your estrogen patch or you pick up your progesterone. And if you're using a FDA approved bioidentical, the pharmacist can change the generic formulation based on whatever's cheapest for them at that time. 
And so um, generic formulations can vary as much as 15% from the brand name product. Now, usually it's not quite that big of a, of a spread. When they pulled, they've done studies and they pulled samples, it's usually around three and a half percent. So thankfully it's not that dramatic, but it can be. So I was at Institute for Functional Medicine meeting last year when I went in person and was just sweating through my clothes. It was very attractive at finally getting to meet some people after we'd come out of the pandemic and we were finally in person and there's Polly in a pool of sweat. But I had got picked up a new prescription of patches and they had switched my generic from Mylan to Sandoz. And the Sandoz patch doesn't stick very well on my skin. Whereas the Mylan patch, I can swim, I can do hot yoga, it, it stays on for me. And so that can be another reason why your hormones aren't working because maybe they switch you to a generic and the generic is different from what you're used to. So sometimes that takes a little bit of legwork on your part to call a pharmacy and say, hey, do you have this version of what I'm taking? If you're a myelin person, do you have the myelin version of the patch? It can take some time and driving around to different pharmacies. If you use an online pharmacy before you get a three month supply or a six month supply, it's probably worth an email or a phone call to say, hey, I really like this kind of patch. Do you have this kind of patch? What are you gonna fill this with? You can also ask your healthcare provider for folks that have identified that they're sensitive to these changes. We can put on the prescription, please dispense only this kind of patch, put it in all caps, put hashtags by it, right? Whatever we can to make it really, really obvious. But sometimes patients will come in and say, well, you changed my patch. And I'm like, no, I, had, I didn't know anything about it. The pharmacy can change the generic version without informing either the patient or the healthcare provider. So if you're noticing that you respond much differently to one generic version or the other, learn the one that works for you, advocate for yourself, shoot an email, pick up the phone, whatever, tell your healthcare provider, hey, can you specify this in the next prescription so that it doesn't keep happening? Because it is a hugely frustrating thing to feel like, hey, I finally got my hormones right and then they're not right. Because we got things to do in the world, right? We don't want to. We don't want to worry about this. Other things that are pretty common. So we detoxify estrogen in our liver, and we eliminate it through our stool. So from a liver health perspective, that's another way that alcohol is metabolized in our liver, right? It's a toxin. We're giving our liver one more thing to have to deal with. So alcohol could affect liver metabolism of hormones. So can any new medications, right? So if you're thinking about seizure medicines, some psychiatric medications, those can interfere with hormone replacement therapy. Thyroid medication can interfere with hormone replacement therapy. So it's really important to communicate if you're on any new medications, if your alcohol level has changed, Another thing that's important to think about with liver health, especially right now, is we're having an enormous problem with non-alcoholic fatty liver. So as we become more insulin resistant, we take in too many carbohydrates and we're not expending them through physical activity, there's no place for the body to store that stored energy, which is stored as fat. We start putting fat in our liver and our liver starts working less well. So if someone's had, maybe they've had no new medications, maybe they're not drinking a lot of alcohol, but they've had a huge jump in their um, insulin resistance and they're starting to store fat in their liver, if they have new onset fatty liver, that could be another reason why their hormones aren't working like we think they should. We need to be checking your liver function. And then lastly, indoor mold, toxin exposure, all those things are going to be really tough on your detoxification systems. So, you know, if someone has a hobby and they refurnish furniture and they're around a lot of volatile organic compounds, that could be another reason why their liver is just having a really hard time processing that and they're gonna to respond to their hormones differently. So you wanna think about liver health. So the liver is where hormones are metabolized and then we have to eliminate them. We poop estrogen out. So we see this a lot in the summer with travel, around the holidays with travel. When people travel, their diet's off, their routine's off and they get constipated. And so a lot of times folks will send messages and say, everything was great. 
and I'm having terrible breast pain. And one of my first questions is usually, are you constipated? You need to get the estrogen out. So looking at gut health can be super important. Another thing along those lines, thinking about bowel health and avoiding constipation is that sometimes women are deciding they're going to really experiment with keto and have an enormous amount of fat and very little to no soluble fiber. Um, And then oftentimes that results in a lot of constipation. And so if you've had a major dietary change, that's important to convey if your hormones stop performing like they think they, like you're used to. Um, Antibiotics and steroids can do it. GI infections. We're seeing a lot of gut issues with long COVID. Again, thinking about thyroid health, an undertreated thyroid or hypothyroidism can cause slowing down of the gut. So those are things to be thinking about if you're all of a sudden not clearing estrogen well. So what about thyroid hormone and um, hormone replacement therapy? This is really important to emphasize and clarify because there are plenty of peri postmenopausal women that have new onset hypothyroidism. It's going to happen around the same time. So we need to be really clear on what's going on with that. So typically in my practice, we're usually only transdermal estradiol because we want to avoid what we call first pass liver metabolism and the blood clotting effects of giving estrogen orally. But if you're on oral estrogen, that's going to increase your thyroglobulin binding hormone, which is going to lower your free thyroid hormone. So if someone starts you on hormones, they need to check your estrogen and progesterone levels. They also need to check your thyroid levels. And so if your gynecologist is doing one and your endocrinologist is doing the other, it really makes sense for everybody to kind of get on the same page because I would argue if you change one, you need to check all of those things and um, communicate with everybody who's on that team. Now, if we're using transdermal estradiol, that doesn't have what we call first pass liver metabolism. So we should have less interaction here than if we had oral estrogen with its interaction with the thyroglobulin binding protein, but it's still worth checking. I think it's still worth checking. It's another thing to think about when someone says, hey, everything was working and now it's not. What about medications? So it's really important. Um, it always amazes me when people like start like eloquence, like a blood thinning medication. They're like, oh yeah, I'm on that. I'm like, whoa, that's a big deal medication. You got to let me know this stuff. So eloquence, the antibiotic Bactrim, usually probably a few days of Bactrim for a UTI aren't going to like throw this off. But if you have like long-term sinusitis and someone's got you on Bactrim for a long time, any time you have a medication change, you should let your healthcare providers know. Interestingly, grapefruit juice can interact with progesterone. So that's important to kind of be aware of. So If something's not working, your hormones aren't working, you're thinking about liver health, you're thinking about gut health, you're also thinking about new medications. And then one thing that we really want to think about is stress. So cortisol, it, you know, cortisol is our stress hormone. That's going to make hot flashes and night sweats worse regardless. And so it's so important to be paying attention to that and really having an active stress management practice. But that can be another reason why you may be um, experiencing new onset and symptoms and your estrogen levels are the same, but your cortisol is much, much higher. We do a lot of vagus nerve work in our practice, Um, things like tapping, humming, breathing exercises, grounding, where you just go outside and put your feet on the grass. You can do ear massages for vagus nerve work. All those things can help lower cortisol. So if you don't have some sort of method to actively de-stress, I think that's a really important component to have in health. If things have been going well and they're not all of a sudden, I would get your hormone levels checked. I would, you know, what's what's going on? Let's get some objective data. Um, I do think it's important. Progesterone levels are very hard to measure. We dose progesterone at bedtime. It's going to peak while you're asleep, and then it's going to start coming down even before you wake up in the morning. 
So if you come in and get your labs checked at three o'clock in the afternoon, the progesterone level is kind of useless because you're basically almost out of progesterone. It's almost bedtime. It's time to, to dose it again. So if you're going to measure progesterone, you want to get it done very first thing in the morning. If you're using a patch, you want to get your levels checked on day two of the patch. So we always want to be consistent. Your levels will look very different on day two of the patch than on the day that you're supposed to change your patch where you're kind of running out of patch. So you always want to be consistent about when you're measuring it. If things feel off, it's probably not a bad idea to get liver function tested, make sure thyroid's okay. Have you had changes in your gut? Are you really constipated? Are you having diarrhea? What's going on with your blood sugar? Do you need a continuous glucose monitor? If that's not available to you, can you at least make sure your hemoglobin A1C is good? Fasting insulin is good. Fasting blood sugar is good. I think journaling symptoms and looking for patterns. Does this only seem to happen when you're in a stressful situation? That can be really insightful. Take a look at caffeine and alcohol use. Take a look at the box they sent you from the pharmacy. Has your generic formulation changed? If you threw the box out, pick up the phone and call the pharmacy. They will have a record of exactly what they dispensed and what they dispensed the time before that. So they should be able to answer the question, hey, did I have a generic formulation change? Could this be why things feel different in my body right now? Please let your healthcare providers know about what kind of medications you're taking. Um, and certainly any new toxin exposure. So my example was furniture refinishing, but it could have been that you were in a moldy basement and you were helping somebody clean out for a yard sale. So any kind of water damage building is worth mentioning. Any kind of um, painting project, crafting project, anything we're exposed to chemicals. So I hope that this was helpful to sort of put your detective hat on and start thinking about if, if your hormones don't feel right, what are some areas that you can start investigating to get things back on track and feeling better sooner? Thanks for listening to Menopause Rescue. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and it helps you create some time and space to make this the best half of your life. If you've enjoyed this content, please leave us a five-star rating and review. This helps other listeners find this resource and rescue and restore their health. If you enjoyed this topic and want to learn more, check out our resource guide for this episode. If today's podcast resonated with you and you want to take a deeper dive, check out my educational resources. We offer basic membership, which is an archive of over 100 videos on menopausal topics ranging from bone health to libido. We add to this archive every month, so the resource becomes richer and richer over time. If you're looking for a menopause expert and live in North Carolina, take our free online class and see if we're a match for your needs. It's called, Are We a Good Fit? And is a quick and easy way to learn more about our practice and what it has to offer. Hey, this is Dr. Watson. This is just a friendly reminder that this podcast is for general information purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine. No doctor-patient relationship is formed and any information you get from this podcast is considered educational only. You should make medical decisions with your healthcare provider. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Listeners should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition, and they should seek assistance from their healthcare professionals.